We're here because you guys are a major part of this new book, I Love You More Than My Dog. Um, a big focus of the book is to really identify beloved companies and kind of get behind the scenes. What's the secret sauce? You know, what's the inner workings behind the clock of that made you beloved? And how are you going to sustain that, especially as you grow? Because you guys have had a big year this year, right? Right. We, we've been able to continue to grow throughout 2008, 2009, despite the economic downturn. So. I think a lot of the things that we put in place in the early years have really been, have really helped us and benefited us through both the crazy hyper growth stages and even throughout uh, a economic downturn like we had in 2008 and 2009. Yep. You're the poster child for these kinds of the companies in this book, which is you sustained who you are, you never walked away from what got you to where you are in the first place, and that is what has kept you growing, prosperous and beloved, even through the, you know what was one of the most you know apocalyptic years in uh, retailing history in the past uh, couple years. So let's ask a couple questions. As you know, sure. there's three case studies about Zappos in the book, and Tony, thank you for the publicity. You're welcome. That's what I'm here <laughs> to do. Um, you know, I love Zappos. It, you know, I started at Land's End, and once I came here, I was like, this is Land's End of shoes. It's so great because it was like coming home again for me. So I'm just, I would be here every day if I could. Um, so we we talked about three case studies in the book. The first one was what I call, or my own characteristic of it is. Um, you guys enable the folks on the phones, your customer loyalty reps, to deliver your version of the miracle on 34th Street every day. And as you remember, that was when the, if a kid wanted something from Santa Claus and Macy's didn't have it, Santa Claus told them where to find it. So tell me about your decision to enable your operators to find shoes people don't have in stock. Well, one of the things that we always thought of was uh, that was important was this relationship, the long-term relationship with a customer. And that was more important to us than any individual sale that we could make. And uh, so it just came about very naturally when we decided that we were going to really focus on customer service. And that you know, if we didn't have something in stock, that we should refer, we should try to find it for the customer. If we can't, that's that's one thing. But if we can, we will. If we don't have it in stock, we'll look for on five different websites um, and try to see if we can find it. We won't place the order for the customer, but we'll, we'll let them know exactly where they can find it. But you know, that's easier said than done, right? Because right. you already don't have a talk time for your for the folks on the phone. And now right. you're adding extra minutes to that ever precious, precious ticker where a lot of companies are putting nickels, dimes, and quarters, and pennies to that time. You know, tell me more about how that's come back to, you know, I call the boomerang effect of that good decision. Well, I think it's just very short-sighted to look at the nickels and dimes that, that you're, t you're trying to cut versus what the effect can be. So one of our core values is deliver well through service. And uh, there is very, very li little incremental cost. Yes, it's more expensive to deliver a wow experience, but it's very little above and beyond what you would consider a satisfactory mm -hmm. uh, yeah. experience. So we don't want to be average. We don't want to just give a satisfactory uh, experience. We don't want you to just be, we're not a customer satisfaction company. Right. We're a service company. And so we want to do that extra, go that extra mile. And the extra mile might cost a little bit more, but the way we think about it, when you have a customer on the phone, you have their undivided attention. Our average talk time is about five to six minutes, so it costs five to six dollars to service that customer. But the value that we get from the branding experience, the, the fact that they tell you know five to ten of their closest friends once they get a wow experience, is priceless. Um, and you know, as a CFO, you can't really say priceless. There's some price <laughs> to it, but it's definitely worth more than five dollars to six dollars on, on average. There's per a call. great return on investment on that. Let's talk for a second what it feels like to be the customer loyalty rep who who's believed in enough to take matters into his or her own hands and do the right thing. You know, the first decision in the book is decide to believe. Mm -hmm. And what does that do for the spirit of the people here? I think, well, the spirit to believe, like we here sort of equate that to just pure empowerment. Mm -hmm. And all of our customer service representatives here are, uh, A, they believe in, in the culture and the, the core values of the company. And uh, we, we only um, sort of recruit people who we believe also believe in the future of Zappos. And then we tell them about what our values are and our core values are um, and our culture. And we, we not only judge their performance based on what they do for the customer, but also if they believe in the culture of the company. And so they truly believe in what we're trying to do. Um, and because of that, I think everybody here is just a lot happier. And they're all aligned on what we're trying to do. And it just makes decisions very, very easy and very, very natural. Um, and we have a very uh, non, 
uh, hierarchical culture here, and the organization is not a top-down driven culture. We believe in a very bottoms-up driven culture. Um, and so we, we tell all the new hires during new hire orientation, this company is not me or Tony or Fred. Uh, the three of us get up and say, you, you know, the three of us come up with all the ideas, that's three great ideas in a day, a month, a year. But if we, if we all come up with great ideas, there's 1,400 of us, that's 1,400 great ideas in that same time frame. Perfect. What a great tee up for the next uh, thing that we talk about in the book, which is this thing which you've gotten so much publicity about. I think every place I go, they're like, did you know Tony? And, and Zappos gives $2,000 for people if they want to leave. So let's talk about that decision you made, which is that throughout orientation and training, once you've hired people, and I know you go through a rigorous process of making sure the shoe fits, so to speak, why, why did you come up with this idea? And exactly what's the concept here? So the concept is that, um, so we came up with this idea that, and Tony came, you know, started the idea and, um, and basically came to me and said, that was a great idea, let's check with legal and, and HR, and they hated it. They thought it was the worst <laughs> idea you've ever thought of. Um, and the concept was that if someone is not committed at Zappos, we should pay them to leave. Um, because there's just friction between um, being here and not having a job. So you're here purely because you don't want to have, you don't want to get over the in inner inertia of finding your next job. It's difficult. So if you pay someone a certain amount of money, you get rid of that friction. Um, and so the concept was refined to, we'll offer it during training. Um, so uh, we're trying to weed out the people who are not committed. Um, the other thing that, other thing that we're trying to weed out is, you know, I'm sure our recruiting team is very, very good at recruiting and interviewing, but if you're really good at judging people, maybe you're right 60 to 70 percent of the time, which means you're still wrong 30 to 40 percent of the time. So we're trying to get rid of the 30 to 40 percent faster. Um, you know, this is we tell people this may not be the right place for you, and they and we know that it's not always the right place for everyone here. So we want to sort of figure out how to sort of transition them out in a respectful re respectful way and. Um, started out with a few hundred dollars, um, very few people took it, and over time we raised it and raised it and raised it, and it's now $2,000. Um, but still, not enough people take it because we're not, we're not seeing that 30 to 40 percent of the people are taking it. The other thing that was interesting is uh, you have to turn down $2,000. Um, the turning down, the actual act of turning it down, um, makes you more committed because you just turn down something that you could just walk away and get. Especially in this economy, right? Especially in this economy and, and especially, um, in, you know, the, we're talking about um, people who work in the call center. Um, it, even if it's easy to find another job um, during the heyday, $2,000 is still a great vacation. So you, it's not, it wasn't hard in 2005 and 2006 and 2007 to find another call center job. So you could have easily just taken the $2,000, gone on vacation, and gotten another job in another, in another call center. So just the idea of having them consciously decide to stay yes. by actively agreeing not to, in their own mind, not to take $2,000 is a test of culture. It, it is a test of culture, and it's a test of commitment, and it's a test to believe in. Yeah. And, and I think the thing that you mentioned at the end was important, because when I tell the story about this thing, is that you enable people to leave with their grace and dignity intact, yeah. and you know you, you use the words get rid of, but people don't feel like they're get, they're they're being ushered out the door. You make it be a reflective decision that they personally make, which I think is really really the secret sauce here. Yeah, I didn't really mean get rid of right. in an active did. sense, um, but because it's their decision that they want to leave. Anybody who wants to work here and we believe can do the job and believe in our culture, we work very very hard to figure out how to make them fit here too. This whole Twitter crazy wow all over the place thing that's happened. I remember when was that? Like three years ago, we were having dinner and Tony's like, "Oh, Gene, you should Twitter." And I'm like, "What's up with that?" And he's like, "Well, you can say I'm having a haircut." And I'm like, "Who wants to know that?" But now, what do you guys? How many people are following you? Um, I think there's about 1.4 million people following Tony. Um, I don't have as big of a following. I have about uh, 10, 11,000 people following me. Uh, it started out in a very simple way. All, you know, Tony went to South by Southwest and uh, they used Twitter to communicate. Uh, he came back and said, you know, there's something to this. I'm not sure where it's going. So he got a few, few of his friends to follow him. 
The following year, when we went back to South by Southwest, we brought a bigger group, and we just started actively using Twitter um, very, very actively. And now we have about, it's not Tony or me that's just using Twitter at Zappos. There's 500 people at Zappos using Twitter. Um, and I think when we started thinking about what Twitter can do, it was more about getting the employees to have a tighter bond with each other, know what's going on. Um, and facilitate serendipity. So I could be at a restaurant, another one of our employees or friends could be you know, at a restaurant across the street and we can get together for drinks afterwards or, or something like that. And it just had a life of its own. And then um, once we got more followers, it became something that was, was interesting because we had customers telling us, you know what, I bought shoes from Zappos today because I, I feel like I personally know the people there. Um, and that that phenomenon we could have never predicted. Well, and I think that's the thing, because when, when I talk to people, they do feel like they know you. You know, they know Alfred or Tony or Mary or Grace or all of these folks, and that you're also reading and watching people's tweets and responding to them. It's the, the natural flow. You know, it's not marketing ploys and, commer you know, all of this other stuff. It's human beings talking to each right. other. And, and it's interesting because it's a technology approach that's actually humanized the relationship, which is one of the things these beloved companies do is they fo somehow find a way to connect commerce with their humanity. Right, and uh, most of our tw uh, tweets are not have nothing to do with promoting Zappos. It's just what we're doing today. I was at the U2 concert uh, during the weekend. I sent out a bunch of pictures and you know, I have friends who thank me for sending that, those pictures. I have um, customers thanking me for uh, sharing that experience with them. So. It, it, it is a definitely an interesting uh, experience to, to just live on this very open sort of world. Probably the easiest and the hardest decisions we made was our decision to stop drop shipping, meaning, um, you know, sent, we used to, when Zappos was f uh, founded, it was, the idea was we were going to market on the web, take orders, and then send it to our brand uh, partners and have them send the product out to our customers. That sounded like a great financial model because you never have to carry any inventory. Well, it, it sounded great, and, but a lot of um, brand manufacturers didn't allow us to do that. So we started taking more inventory and over time um, we noticed that when we control the experience, we were able to deliver a much better customer experience for our customers. And, uh, there's a, a confession bell over there <laughs> going on. What uh, is that? We have a, on our tour, we have a little confession bell, and people ring it, and they, they're supposed to yell out to the crowd here or something that they wanted to confess. Oh, and, I love that. <laughs> anyway, getting back to the question. Just another, another day here at Zappos. Yeah, yep, it's just another day at Zappos. Lots of tours going by. And uh, so getting back to that great idea, financial model, it didn't always work out, so we started inventorying more and more product. Um, and we noticed that when we control the experience, um, our, our customers got a better experience. So we, one day we decided that we we're going to stop drop, sh drop shipping, but we had to forego 25% of the revenue at the time. So it was certainly one of the hard decisions because it was hard to give up. This is a time when Zappos is still small, 25% of revenue was a big deal. Um, and take on much greater financial burden because we needed to inventory all of our product, which means we had greater cash capital and cash uh, needs. But that decision to stop drop shipping and focus on service, I think, has helped us tremendously in the past few years in terms of our growth. Well, how hard of a sell was that to your board at the time? Well, then we, we didn't really have um, many outside investors, so it was basically a decision that you know Tony and Fred and and you know I sort of participated in and. I was basically the board back then, and, <laughs> and so it was an easy decision. But one concrete example of just constantly evolving is that our vision changed along the way over time. And um, uh, when we started, Nick couldn't find the particular pair of shoes that he was looking for. So when he founded the company, it was all about selection. And then we evolved to be about selection and service. And what do we mean by service? Well, what does it mean to be powered by service? Um, so we came up with the idea of creating a personal emotional connection with the customer and now we're moving on to delivering happiness. That's just ever expanding our vision uh, every single day and we have to, because we're expanding our vision, we have to constantly evolve the company to deliver um, on behalf of the customer.